Christ Reformed Church on our fourth Sunday in exile. It is Palm Sunday, April 5th, 2020. Uh, a couple of brief announcements before we begin. Uh, if you are interested in keeping track of us, we do have a Christ Reform uh, YouTube page with the sermons we've given during our time in exile, along with our catechism lessons that deal with reasons as to why we have suspended our service, uh, drawing upon the wisdom of none of the scriptures, but the Reformed Confessions and some of the commentary by great Reformed theologians on that. So if that's of interest to you, check out our YouTube page, Christ Reform. Uh, you can also uh, follow us at our website, ChristReform.org, for the latest calendar of suspended services. And then uh, if you go to our uh, private Facebook page, and members of the church are welcome to uh, check that. There are a lot of prayer requests, uh, some updates from the deacons, and other things I would really encourage you to take a look at. So uh, without further ado on this Palm Sunday, let us take a minute and quiet our minds and hearts and prepare for worship. Our call to worship this morning, the words of the 121st Psalm. I lift up my eyes to the hills. From where does my help come? My help comes from the Lord who made heaven and earth. He will not let your foot be moved. He who keeps you will not slumber. Behold, he who keeps Israel will neither slumber nor sleep. The Lord is your keeper. The Lord is your shade on your right hand. The sun shall not strike you by day nor the moon by night. The Lord will keep you from all evil. He will keep your life. The Lord will keep your going out and your coming in from this time forth and forevermore. Beloved, my help comes from the Lord who made heaven and earth. Grace be to and peace from God our Father and from the Lord Jesus Christ and the power and fellowship of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. The reading of the law this morning comes from the Gospel of Matthew, chapter 5, beginning at verse 17 through verse 20. Do not think that I have come to abolish the law of the prophets. I have not come to abolish them, but to fulfill them. For truly I say to you, until heaven and earth pass away, not an iota, not a dot, will pass from the law until all is accomplished. Therefore, whoever relaxes one of the least of these commandments and teaches others to do the same will be called least in the kingdom of heaven. But whoever does them and teaches them will be called great in the kingdom of heaven. For I tell you, unless your righteousness exceeds that of the scribes and the Pharisees, you will not enter the kingdom of heaven. Dearly loved brothers and sisters, we are called to examine ourselves in the light of God's law. Let us go to God in public confession. Our Father, we are sinful and you are holy. We recognize that we have heard in your law difficult words, knowing how often we have offended you in thought, word, and deed, not only by obvious violations, but by failing to conform to its perfect commands. By what we have done, and by what we have left undone. There is nothing in us that gives us reason for hope. For where we thought we were well, we are sick in soul. Where we thought we were holy, we are in truth unholy and ungrateful. Our hearts are filled with the love of the world. Our minds are dark and are assailed by doubts. Our wills are too often given to selfishness and our bodies to laziness and unrighteousness. By sinning against our neighbors, we have also sinned against you in whose image they were created. In this time of silent confession, we bring you our particular sins. Our Father, 
Although you are a holy God who cannot look upon sin, look upon Christ our Savior and forgive us for his sake. You have promised us that if we confess our sins, you are faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. For if we do sin, we have an advocate before your throne, Jesus Christ the righteous, and he is the propitiation for our sins. Give us your pardon by your mercies, dear Father, for you have clothed us in Christ's righteousness. We ask also that you give us an increase of the grace of your Holy Spirit, so that we may learn the wisdom of your ways and walk in your holy paths. For your glory and the good of our neighbor. Amen. Brothers and sisters, you have heard the law and have confessed your sins to Almighty God. Do you believe that Jesus Christ, by his perfect life, sacrificial death, and glorious resurrection, has atoned for your sins and satisfied the wrath of God toward you? In the name of Christ and by the authority of his word, I declare that your sins are forgiven, that you are not under the condemnation of God. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit and born of the Virgin Mary. He suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of God, the Father Almighty. From there he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Our pastoral prayer this morning comes from the United Reformed Church Book of Forms and Prayers. This is a prayer for the sick and spiritually distressed uh, on page 120. This is the third of that series of prayers, and I thought it would be very appropriate to use this as our pastoral prayer this morning. Let us pray. Almighty, eternal, and righteous God, our merciful Father, you are the Lord of life and death. We are not worthy to call on your name nor to hope that you will listen to us when we consider how we've spent our time in this life. Yet we pray that you will, according to your mercy, look upon us in Christ, who has taken upon himself all our infirmities. We acknowledge that on account of who we are, apart from him, we deserve far more than this affliction. But Lord, we are your people, and you are our God. Your mercy, which you've never withheld from those who turn to you, is our only refuge. Therefore, we pray, count not our sins against us, but impute to us the wisdom and righteousness and holiness of the Savior. For his sake, deliver us from this suffering, in order that the evil one may not regard us as forsaken by God. And if it pleases you to prolong our trial, give us patience and strength to bear it all according to your will. And may it be in your wisdom for our edification. We would rather be chastised here, Lord, than to perish in the world hereafter. Grant that we may die to this world and to all earthly things, that we may be daily renewed after the image of Jesus Christ. Permit us never to be separated from your love, but draw us daily closer and closer to you, that at last we may enter with joy upon the end of our divine calling, which is to die with Christ and rise with him triumphantly and live with him eternally. We pray that you will hear us through our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, in whose name we have prayed this prayer. Amen. The Old Testament lesson comes to us today from 2 Samuel chapter 7, verses 4 through 17. Let's give ear now to the word of God. But that same night, the word of the Lord came to Nathan, Go and tell my servant David, thus says the Lord, Would you build me a house to dwell in? I have not lived in a house since the day I brought up the people of Israel from Egypt to this day. But I have been moving about in a tent for my dwelling. In all places where I have moved with all the people of Israel, did I speak a word with any of the judges of Israel, whom I commanded to shepherd my people Israel, saying, Why have you not built me a house of cedar? Now therefore thus you shall say to my servant David, Thus says the Lord of hosts, I took you from the pasture, from following the sheep, that you should be prince over my people Israel. 
And I have been with you wherever you went and have cut off all your enemies from before you. And I will make for you a great name, like the name of the great ones of the earth. And I will appoint a place for my people Israel, and I will plant them, so that they may dwell in their own place and be disturbed no more. And violent men shall afflict them no more, as formerly, from the time that I appointed judges over my people Israel. And I will give you rest from all your enemies. Moreover, the Lord declares to you that the Lord will make you a house. When your days are fulfilled and you lie down with your fathers, I will raise up your offspring after you, who shall come from your body, and I will establish his kingdom. He shall build a house for my name, and I will establish the throne of his kingdom forever. I will be to him a father, and he shall be to me a son. When he commits iniquity, I will discipline him with the rod of men, with the stripes of the sons of men. But my steadfast love will not depart from him, as I took it from Saul, whom I put away from before you. And your house and your kingdom shall be made sure forever before me. Your throne shall be established forever. In accordance with all these words, in accordance with all this vision, Nathan spoke to David. Let's pray. Our Father, we have heard wonderful things out of your word. We praise you for revealing Christ by promise and shadow in these pages. Help us to understand these words for your name's sake. Amen. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Ghost, as it was in the beginning, is now, and ever shall be, world without end. Amen. Amen. Our New Testament lesson comes to us from Mark chapter 11, verses 1 through 11. Now when they drew near to Jerusalem, to Bethphage and Bethany, at the Mount of Olives, Jesus sent two of his disciples and said to them, Go into the village in front of you, and immediately as you enter it, you will find a colt tied, on which no one has ever sat. Untie it and bring it. If anyone says to you, Why are you doing this? Say, The Lord has need of it and will send it back here immediately. And they went away and found a colt tied to a, at a door outside in the street, and they untied it. And some of those standing there said to them, What are you doing, untying the colt? And they told them what Jesus had said, and they let them go. And they brought the colt to Jesus and threw their cloaks on it, and he sat on it. And many spread their cloaks on the road, and others spread leafy branches that they had cut from the fields. And those who went before and those who followed were shouting, Hosanna! Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Blessed is the coming kingdom of our father David. Hosanna in the highest. And he entered Jerusalem and went into the temple. And when he had looked around at everything, as it was already late, he went out to Bethany with the twelve. Let's pray. Our Father, we have heard wonderful things out of your word We praise you for revealing Christ as the fulfillment of the Old Testament and ask you to give us your spirit so that we may understand the fullness of your truth. Amen. In the glory days of Israel, David and Solomon ruled over a united kingdom. But the glory days were long past and the people of Israel desperately longed for a king who would make Israel great again. God had promised that a king from the line of David would one day rule over Israel, but with Roman troops occupying the city of Jerusalem and the surrounding environs, the fulfillment of that promise seemed like an impossibility. Although Herod was a reigning monarch and who was a Jew and a king of sorts, the reality was he was nothing but a puppet of Rome, and that, of course, added insult to injury. The Jewish people longed for a promised messianic king who would come and take his rightful place on David's throne. And on Palm Sunday, that day had finally and blessedly come. 
Now today we enter Easter week, that time on the Christian calendar, and we turn our focus to our Lord's messianic mission, which is summarized in our Heidelberg Catechism as follows. During his whole life on earth, but especially at the end, Christ sustained in body and soul the anger of God against the sin of the whole human race. This Easter season, we're going to be looking at the events of the last week of Jesus' messianic mission as recounted in the Gospel of Mark, while at the same time we'll be considering a number of those Old Testament prophecies which Jesus fulfilled during this uh, same week. Now on this Palm Sunday, we're going to consider Jesus' kingly office as he enters the royal city, Jerusalem, as Israel's long-expected Messiah. On Good Friday, we're going to consider Mark's account of Jesus' crucifixion, brutal and graphic as it is, and we'll ask and answer the question, why did Jesus endure such suffering for us? Then on Easter Sunday, we're going to consider the angel's words to the women who came to Christ's tomb to care for his body. He is risen. He's not here. And those words, of course, are a great cause to celebrate Christ's resurrection and his triumph over death and the grave that marks the dawn of a glorious new age of salvation and the renewal of all things. Now, our Lord's entrance into Jerusalem on Palm Sunday is directly connected to God's covenant promise to his people that he will provide for them a king. Now, we need to consider that promise as but part of a larger covenant promise that God made to Abraham back in Genesis 12, verses 1 through 3, in which God promises to call a people to be his own and then give them a land in which to establish that kingdom and then make them into a great nation. Now, like the other kingdom promises throughout the Old Testament, the biblical promises associated with this kingship are fulfilled in two distinct stages. Now, the first stage of fulfillment can be traced throughout Israel's history, beginning with God's call of Abram through his son Isaac and grandson Jacob, down to Moses to the time of captivity in Egypt, to the Passover and conquest of the Promised Land, then finally to the birth and kingship of David and to the establishment of the royal throne and the Messianic lineage in Jerusalem. The second stage of fulfillment can be seen with the coming of Jesus Christ, in whom all of the promises that God has made to his people about a coming king and a kingdom and a promised land, in him they find their fulfillment. And so the first stage of the promise and its fulfillment is conditional and it's typological. That is, it points beyond itself to something much greater, Jesus Christ as the fulfillment of all that God has promised. Now this morning, then, we're going to look at both stages of the fulfillment of God's covenant promises to provide his people with a king. Now, as mentioned, the story of the Davidic kingship in Israel really begins with the covenant that God made with Abram, Abraham, recorded back in Genesis 17, verses 1 through 6. And there we read the following. When Abram was 99 years old, the Lord appeared to Abram and said to him, I am God Almighty, walk before me, be blameless, that I may make my covenant between me and you, and may you multiply greatly. God confirms this covenant and promises Abram a vast number of descendants. And this covenant is going to be ratified through the sign and seal of circumcision. And since 99-year-old men usually don't father children, this really is an amazing promise. Now, Yahweh then says to Abram in verse 6, I will make you exceedingly fruitful, He's 99. I will make you into nations, and kings shall come from you. And so with those words, the kingdom promises begin to take concrete shape. Now, the same promise is reiterated to Sarai, Abram's wife, in verse 16. I will bless her, and moreover, I will give you a son by her. I will bless her, and she'll become nations. Kings of people shall come from her. And so really, for the first time, we're told that The promise of a kingdom is going to include the promise of a land in which such a kingdom can be established and that there will be a vast number of descendants, one of whom eventually is going to reign over this coming kingdom. And so the promise of a king entails the creation of a kingdom over which that king might rule. Now a king and a kingdom as the two elements of Yahweh's covenant promise become inseparable as the promise continues to unfold throughout the pages of the Old Testament, and should be understood in light of that original covenant of grace that God makes with Abraham. 
Now, as Meredith Klein points out, this can be seen in the oft-overlooked fact that when God promises Abram and Sarai that one of their own descendants will be king and rule over God's people, God, the great king, must himself provide the commoners, Abram and Sarai, with a divine grant of royalty. And that's why Yahweh changes the names of Abram and Sarai to the royal names Abraham and Sarah, as in verse 5 of Genesis 17, when God tells Abram, No longer shall your name be called Abram, but your name shall be called Abraham. For I have made you the father of a multitude of nations. And again in verse 15, God said to Abraham, As for Sarai your wife, you shall not call her name Sarai, but Sarah shall be her name. Now, kings cannot come from commoners, so this unmerited grant of divine royalty is given to Abraham and Sarah as seen in their change of names. Now, the story of covenant kingship continues two generations later with Abraham's grandson, Jacob. And so we have this generation-to-generation continuity of the covenant found in Genesis 35, verses 10 through 11, as God continues to fulfill his covenant promise of a king. Now, here again, we find another divinely commanded change in name connected to the formation of a kingdom and the provision of the king. And so God said to Jacob, your name is Jacob. No longer shall you be called Jacob, but Israel shall be your name. So he called his name Israel. And God said to him, I am God Almighty, be fruitful and multiply. A nation and a company of nations shall come from you, and kings shall come from your own body. Now with the change of his name, Jacob becomes the father of a nation, Israel, the nation over which God's coming king will eventually reign. There will be a king, so there is a need for royal parents. Now, there must also be a people to come from Jacob's own body who are going to have a royal bloodline to bring about that promised king. And so God reaffirms his promise to create a kingdom and provide that kingdom with a king whose ancestry is traceable all the way back through Jacob to Abraham and Sarah. Now, the story continues to play out as recounted in Genesis chapter 46, when, knowing that he's dying, Jacob went into Egypt to be reunited with his son, Joseph. And he gathers his sons together for the famous patriarchal blessing. And so in Genesis 49, we find yet again the dual promise of a king and a kingdom set forth in Jacob's own words of blessing to his son, Judah. And so in Genesis 49, 1, we read, Then Jacob called his sons and said, Gather yourselves together that I may tell you what shall happen to you in the days to come. Now, skipping ahead to verses 8 to 12, we see the surprising direction that this old man's blessing of his sons eventually takes. Judah, your brother shall praise you. Your hand shall be on the neck of your enemies. Your father's son shall bow down before you. Judah is a lion's cub. From the prey, my son, you have gone up. He stooped down, he crouched as a lion, and as a lioness, who dares rouse him? The scepter shall not depart from Judah, nor the ruler's staff from between his feet, until tribute comes to him, and to him shall be the obedience of the peoples. Binding his foal to the vine and his donkey's colt to the choice vine, he has washed his garments in wine and his vesture in the blood of grapes." His eyes are darker than wine, his teeth are whiter than milk. Now, Jacob's final blessing of Judah is full of these great themes of covenant, namely blessing and curse. And once again, his words are steeped in this language of a promised king and a promised kingdom. Now, the promise, as we know, passes down from Abram to Isaac to Jacob, down through Judah even though Joseph is singled out by his father for royal authority, which is why Joseph becomes the type of Christ. But nevertheless, it's from the line of Judah, not from the line of Joseph, that the promised king will come. And so the scepter, which is the symbol of royal authority, will not depart from Judah, nor the ruler's staff from between his feet, until tribute comes to him to whom it belongs, and the obedience of the nations is his. Now, this coming one called Shiloh, in Hebrew, tribute is the word used in the ESV, 
This coming one will possess royal authority as the Lord of all the peoples. His reign will be characterized by abundance for the people of God. The land is going to overflow with wine and milk. And this coming ruler will not only lead his people to victory, he's going to bring them into a period of material prosperity. And that can be seen in verse 11 of Genesis 49 when this coming king will lead his people into battle. He will crush God's enemies in the wine press of judgment, the graphic language of washing his garments in wine and his royal robe in blood. That, of course, will provide the victory necessary for prosperity. With this declaration, the two stages of a coming king and kingdom come into view. In the first stage of fulfillment, God's promise to Israel, Jacob prophesied that Israel's own king would come from the line of Judah, the father of one of the 12 tribes, of course, of Israel. Judah's royal scepter will never depart from him until one of Judah's own descendants ascends the throne of Israel and establishes a great kingdom. Now, this is obviously a prophetic reference to David, who will not only preside over numerous victories over Israel's enemies, but he'll also lead the nation into a time of its, perhaps its greatest prosperity. Israel's future as a nation is hereby secured even while she's living in the midst of her enemies. Now, as far as that first stage of fulfillment goes, if Israel is obedient to the covenant, the people will be victorious and prosperous. But if the nation is not obedient, it will fall and blessing will become curse. Now, the first stage of a promise the king is conditioned upon Israel's own obedience as a people. Yet the second stage is not conditioned on the obedience of the people, but on the obedience of the king himself. Now, the reference to Shiloh, this coming prince of peace, is clearly a reference to the coming Messiah, of whom David is a type, that is a forerunner of a heavenly king. Shiloh makes his own people prosper, and we'll find out later that Shiloh is going to give his people all the riches and treasures of heaven, but he will also secure the great victory of God's kingdom in which all of God's enemies are finally and thoroughly crushed. Shiloh, this man of peace, is also the Lion of Judah, who will fill his robes with a crimson flood to save God's people from their sin. The image in Genesis 49 is that he will wash his garments in wine, his vesture in the blood of grapes. This, of course, is a prophetic reference to the coming cross of Jesus, as well as to a final judgment yet to come. Now, as depicted in Revelation chapter 19, verses 11 through 16, we're told that at the end of the age, the Lion of Judah is the one who will judge the nations. Says John, Then I saw heaven open, and behold, a white horse. The one sitting on it is called Faithful and True, and in righteousness he judges and makes war. His eyes are like a flame of fire, and on his head are many diadems. And he has a name written that no one knows but himself. He is clothed in a robe dipped in blood, and the name by which he is called is the Word of God. And the armies of heaven, arrayed in fine linen, white and pure, were following him on white horses. From his mouth comes a sharp sword with which to strike down the nations, and he will rule them with a rod of iron. He will tread the winepress of the fury of the wrath of God the Almighty. And on his Roman thigh he has the name written, King of Kings and Lord of Lords. The words of Jacob in Genesis 49 have a two-stage fulfillment. When David, who descends from the tribe of Judah, becomes Israel's king, the royal promise God made to Abraham and Jacob is fulfilled. But as we'll see, the second stage of fulfillment must await that day when Jesus comes to his royal city. That's Palm Sunday. Now, descended from the line of Judah, David, the heir to God's royal title and earthly throne, he stands in the line of covenant succession that passes down from Abram to David's own father, who is Jesse. And the meaning of this Davidic kingship can be most clearly seen in the famous prophecy of 2 Samuel 7, verses 4 through 17, which was our Old Testament lesson for Palm Sunday. Now, it's about 1000 B.C. when David became king of Israel, as described in 2 Samuel chapter 5. After a series of defeats by the Philistines, the tribes of Israel gathered and conferred on David the mantle of kingship that had previously belonged to Saul. And in doing so, they acknowledged the covenant promise of kingship with the words, The Lord said to you, David, that you will shepherd my people Israel, and you will become their ruler." 
from 2 Samuel chapter 5, verses 1 through 5. And God made good on that promise then that he'd first spoken to Abraham. Now, it's not long after this that David led the army of Israel from their base of operations in the city of Hebron up to the city of Jerusalem, which was then occupied by the Jebusites. And though Jerusalem was heavily fortified, its defenses were seemingly unassailable, David led his men into victory by entering secretly through the underground water shaft. It's a stunning victory, especially after the Jebusites taunted the Israelites with the words, you will not come in here, but the blind and lame will ward you off. So much for that. Now with Mount Zion, the physical mount in possession of God's people, it's not long before the city of Jerusalem is restored, the Philistines are defeated, and the Ark of the Covenant have been brought into David's royal city. As 2 Samuel 5 verse 12 puts it, David knew that the Lord had established him king over Israel and that he had exalted his kingdom for the sake of his people, Israel. Now, as we'll see in chapter 7 of 2 Samuel, once the first stage of the covenant promise was fulfilled when a son of Abraham and Jacob and Judah sat on Israel's royal throne just as Yahweh had promised, the second stage of fulfillment is now itself embodied in a separate covenant, the so-called Davidic covenant. The covenant-keeping God gives David a new covenantal guarantee that his own kingly dynasty will endure forever and that his own descendants will build God's temple in the city of Jerusalem. And so the second stage unfolds directly from the first, and that can be seen in the words that Nathan the prophet spoke to David from our Old Testament lesson. But that same night, the word of the Lord came to Nathan. Go and tell my servant David. Thus says the Lord, would you build me a house to dwell in? I have not lived in a house since the day I brought up the people of Israel from Egypt to this day. But I've been moving about in a tent for my dwelling. In all places where I have moved with all the people of Israel, did I speak a word with any of the judges of Israel whom I commanded to shepherd my people of Israel, saying, Why have you not built for me a house of cedar? Now, therefore, thus you shall say to my servant David, Thus says the Lord of hosts, I took you from the pasture, from following the sheep, that you should be prince over my people Israel. And I have been with you wherever you went, and have cut off all your enemies from before you, and I will make for you a great name, like the name of the great ones of the earth. I will appoint a place for my people Israel, and I will plant them, so that they may dwell in their own place and be disturbed no more. And violent men shall afflict them no more, as formerly from the time that I appointed judges over my people Israel. And I will give you rest from all your enemies, appointed judges over my people Israel. I skipped a line, sorry. And violent men shall afflict them no more, as formerly. From the time that I appointed judges over my people Israel, I will give you rest from all your enemies. Moreover, the Lord declares to you that the Lord will make you a house. When your days are fulfilled and you lie down with your fathers, I will raise up your offspring after you, you who shall come from your own body, and I will establish his kingdom. He shall build a house for my name, and I will establish the throne of his kingdom forever. I will be to him a father, and he shall be to me a son. When he commits iniquity... I will discipline him with the rod of men, with the stripes of the sons of men. But my steadfast love will not depart from him as I took it from Saul, whom I put away from before you. And your house and your kingdom shall be made sure forever before me. Your throne shall be established forever. In accordance with all these words, in accordance with all this vision, Nathan spoke to David. Now, in the words of this remarkable prophecy from Nathan, once again, we see these two stages of fulfillment. David's own son by Bathsheba, Solomon did indeed build God's house in Jerusalem, the magnificent temple of Yahweh, which is known throughout the ancient world for its splendor. The first stage of the prophecy comes to pass exactly as Nathan foretold that it would. The Lord will make you a house. I will raise up your offspring after you who shall come from your body, and I will establish the throne of his kingdom forever. And so when Solomon builds that temple, the first stage of the promise is fulfilled. The second stage of fulfillment to come is in the reign of Jesus Christ, because David's kingdom truly lives on 
and the dynastic succession is never broken. Jesus does not reign for but a single generation, a single lifetime as an earthly king, only to die and then go to his fathers. Jesus' reign is eternal. In him alone are the words, your throne shall be established forever fulfilled. The king comes to his royal city in fulfillment of that second stage of the prophecy on Palm Sunday. Now, the two stages of fulfillment are also seen in the construction of the temple in Jerusalem, which was a house in which Yahweh might dwell. In the first stage of fulfillment, the construction of Solomon's temple and the establishment of an earthly holy of holies, God was present with his people through his chosen representative, the high priest, who entered the holy of holies to meet with God. However, it's not until the coming of Jesus Christ, the second stage, who said of himself that he's greater than the temple, according to Matthew 12, verse 6. It's not until then that we learn that the temple of Solomon actually pointed to the heavenly temple and to the mystical body of Jesus Christ, the church, where the Spirit of God dwells in fullness with his people until all these earthly things give way to the eternal promises of the age to come. Now, at the time of our Lord's entrance into Jerusalem, at the end of Jesus' messianic mission... This is exactly what the people of Israel could not understand. A misguided zeal to protect the temple uh, is the central reason why Jesus was in fact put to death. His accusers twisted our Lord's words about the coming judgment upon Israel to, to mean that somehow Jesus was threatening to destroy the temple and that he was actually speaking against the house of God. Now another way in which we see this two-stage fulfillment in this prophecy of Nathan is found in the words, when he commits iniquity, I will discipline him with the rod of men, with the stripes of the sons of men, but my steadfast love will not depart from him, as I took it from Saul, whom I put away from before you. According to the first stage of fulfillment, God was warning David's successor to be obedient to the terms of the covenant, or else face the consequences, blessing, curse. And when Israel's royal line and David's descendants subsequently fell into apostasy and served and worshipped false gods, God punished them with the rod of men. Military victories became defeats, and Israel was subsequently conquered and divided and led into captivity. And yet, as he promised, God remains faithful. And so after the captivity in Babylon, Israel returned to the land once again, rebuilt the temple, what we call the second temple. And that temple was still standing when Jesus came to take his place on David's royal throne 400 years later. Now the irony in this is that in the second stage of fulfillment, even though Jesus was perfectly obedient to the terms of the covenant, when God imputed to him the guilt of our sins while he suffered on Calvary's tree, he bore in his own body the rod of men And in the flogging, took away the guilt of our covenant breaking. Now, it's with all that rich and deep covenant history in mind that we turn to our New Testament lesson in the account of Jesus entering David's royal city in fulfillment of that great promise of both a king and a kingdom. On Palm Sunday, all of the Old Testament promises about a coming Davidic kingdom are fulfilled. Now, when Jesus entered Jerusalem, the city was packed with pilgrims celebrating the annual Passover. As he made his way through the Galilee region, heading south to Jerusalem through the Jordan River Valley, huge crowds were now following Jesus everywhere he went. Jesus was widely known as a miracle worker, and people knew that he taught with authority, unlike the scribes and the Pharisees. He claimed to be Israel's Messiah and the one who would finally bring God's salvation to his people, And although the religious establishment hated him, it was clear that in this man, God was bringing David's heir back to Israel's throne. The people flocked to him, sensing that this great day of fulfillment was at hand. Israel would have a king again. This is really a day of biblical proportions. And so we pick up with Mark's account of this, beginning in verse 1 of chapter 11. Now when they drew near to Jerusalem, to Bethphage and Bethany at the Mount of Olives, Jesus sent two of his disciples and said to them, Go into the village in front of you, and immediately as you enter it you will find a colt tied on which no one has ever sat. Untie it and bring it. 
If anyone says to you, why are you doing this? Say, the Lord has need of it, and he'll send it back here immediately. And they went away and found a colt tied to a door outside in the street, and they untied it. And some of those standing there said to them, what are you doing untying the colt? And they told him what Jesus had said, and they let them go, and they brought the colt to Jesus and threw their cloaks on it, and he sat on it. Now, the messianic significance of this day is just overwhelming. The prophet Zechariah, a whole other line of prophecy, predicted hundreds of years prior that the Messiah would enter his royal city riding on a donkey. At the sight of Jesus sitting on a beast of burden and not a royal steed, a horse of war, it's clear that the day when David's heir would ascend his throne has finally come. But there are also profound covenantal ramifications to his choice of animals because there are known instances in that time period in which a foal, the colt of a young donkey, was slain to ratify covenants between great kings and vassals. The symbolism, accidental, coincidental, who knows? But even if Israel's own leaders did not welcome the messianic implications of Jesus' act, the people certainly saw it and they welcomed it, says Mark. Many spread their cloaks on the road and others spread leafy branches that they cut from the fields. And those who went before and those who followed were shouting, Hosanna! Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Blessed is the coming king of our father David. Hosanna in the highest. And then Jesus entered the temple, Mark says, just simply, Jesus entered Jerusalem and went to the temple. At long last, Israel's king has come to claim his throne and enter Yahweh's house, which had been built for him. It was a day of joy and it's a day of celebration that Israel had not experienced since back in the days of David and Solomon. God had kept his ancient promise to David's son, your throne shall be established forever. Now the tragedy underlying this messianic excitement was the fact that the people only saw the second stage of fulfillment and never even considered that there's another stage of fulfillment yet to come. They saw in Jesus' miraculous power a return to national glory and perhaps a liberation from the power and oppression of Rome. They saw in Jesus a king like David, someone who would lead them back to the glory days. But the way in which God would fulfill this stage of his promise to establish the throne of his king takes a very sudden and unexpected turn. On this day, to the shouts of Hosanna to the son of David, Jesus, who is the descendant of David, of Jesse, of Judah, of Jacob, and of Abraham, enters his royal city, fulfilling the promise of Nathan and the promise God had made to Abraham nearly 2,000 years earlier. But once in the city, it became clear that Jesus' kingship pointed beyond merely an earthly uh, throne in Jerusalem to a heavenly rule that extends far beyond the borders of Israel. Because Jesus immediately went to the temple, a very pointed reminder that in five short days, he will wash his royal robes with his own blood on Calvary's cross. This king will conquer by taking his place It's not a great king, but as the Passover lamb. In laying down his life, Jesus once and for all conquers our greatest enemy. Not the Philistines, not the Jebusites, not the Romans. Our greatest enemy is the guilt and power of sin. And Jesus defeats both and will go on to even defeat death, our greatest enemy. And so it's in the death and the resurrection and ascension of Jesus Christ that God fulfills this glorious promise. Your throne shall be established forever. I will establish the throne of his kingdom, Jesus, forever. And so on Palm Sunday, we see the second stage of God's promise of a king and a kingdom fulfilled in Jesus of Nazareth, the son of David. So on this day, it's customary and it's good to turn our eyes to heaven in faith, where Jesus now rules and reigns forever, because his throne is established in heaven And the scepter is never going to depart. And one day, that same Jesus who entered Jerusalem this day riding on a colt of a donkey will come again with great clouds of glory 
when he destroys that last enemy, which is death itself. And he will tread the winepress of the fury of the wrath of God, the Almighty. On his robe and on his thigh, remember, there is a name written, King of Kings and Lord of Lords. On Palm Sunday, we witness God's faithfulness to this promise while we still look forward to that great day yet to come. We joyfully add our voices on Palm Sunday to the crowd chanting, Hosanna to the Son of David. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Blessed is the coming kingdom of our father David. Brothers and sisters, Jesus is King of kings and Lord of, Lord of lords. On this day long ago, he took his place on David's throne and he went to that house that had been built for him. Now ascended, Jesus rules and reigns in the right hand of God the Father until that great and glorious day when he comes again. And so on Palm Sunday, we see that Jesus the King fulfills all the kingdom promises, and therefore all of the promises of God are yea and amen. And so on this Palm Sunday, go with the Lord's blessing. May the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all evermore. Amen.